Well, who? We got to liven you up. We're talking about eating bugs. Come on. So yes, I am uh, an extension educator up in Medina County, and I am an entomologist by training. I uh, started my education at Baldwin Wallace as a sociology major, go figure, and I took a bug class and I fell in love and switched my masters over to entomology and the rest is history. Um, I got interested in entomophagy because um, the Department of Entomology here at OSU does a kids program called A Bugs World and there are different stations all over um, the OARGC Worcester campus and students from second and third grade, they come as a field trip and they get to learn about insects and the life cycle. And one of the activities they do is called Cafe Insecta. And for many years, we had a professor who would saute them up live and he would tell them, you know, why people eat bugs. And then he retired. And uh, fortunately, because I went to OSU for my entomology degree, uh, they said, Ashley, do you want to do this? And I said, of course. What's more fun than teaching kids about eating bugs? And so we've been teaching kids about bugs. So one of the things uh, Jim didn't mention was in your USB drive, you will be getting my Cafe Insecta presentation, which is just about maybe 10 slides, with a detailed script about how I talk to kids about eating insects. And so you, I know a couple people are from 4-H. Raise your hand if you're from 4-H. All right, so you can use that to teach your clubs, or if you go to camp, you know, bug juice at camp, come on, let's add some bug cookies. So uh, you can use that as well, and I always, you know, bring a chef's hat, you gotta play the part, so that's my little introduction. But today, um, you are not going to see the kids program, you're going to see the adult program, so you guys have the information in the background if you want to go down to, you know, teaching those kids um, more. Or if you are teaching adults, you'll have this program available on your USB as well, which is more, you know, adult speed. So I asked the question, are bugs the food of the future? So today we're going to go over what are insects real quick, in case any of you are not entomologists. Um, insects in the food conversation. Why have insects come up so much more frequently now? Why now? And we'll talk specifically about things that are mentioned in the report you got, that FAO report. Um, so we'll talk about population growth and food production. Uh, we'll talk about why insects are being considered as food. And we'll talk about cultural precedence, efficiency, and nutrition and taste. And then you'll get some specific presentations about that later as well. And then also some of the challenges we face as we move forward into this industry. So your brief introduction, what is an insect? Well, they are arthropods, and arthropod means jointed foot. So this includes the insects, shrimp, lobster, and crab. So who eats shrimp, lobster, and crab? So now we're just adding one more. They're all arthropods. So they are segmented. They have that hard, crunchy exoskeleton that you have to fight with when you're eating your crab and lobster. Um, jointed paired appendages. Insects have three body segments, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. So we're not talking about spiders, though people do eat spiders in parts of the world. Um, they have six legs and wings in one form of their life cycle, usually. So that's your general definition of what an insect is. When we talk about entomophagy or entomophagy, the eating of insects, sometimes they'll lump in those other arthropods, like centipedes or spiders, but we're going to focus specifically on insects today. So it's kind of important to point out that insects make up a huge portion of all the animal kingdom. So it's kind of hard to see with the lighting we have, but here in red are the described species of insects, and it makes up about 52% of all of Earth's inhabitants. So that's a lot of potential food we're ignoring compared to 3% of the chordates, which are what we eat. Mammals, fish, we're chordates. We have that spine. That's what the name is, the chord. And so you can see that a huge portion of Earth's inhabitants are made up of insects. And so we're going to look at maybe eating them. So how have insects entered the food conversation? Why are you here at this presentation? Why is OSU giving a talk on um, eating insects? Well, arguably, they have always been part of somebody's food conversation. Jim mentioned survival. We think back to our ancient, ancient ancestors, hunters and gatherers. They were eating bugs, most likely. Um, and so it's always been a part of some culture's food conversation. And in today's world, it is part of somebody's food culture. 
And as early as the 1880s, we can say the European Western society um, has considered it as well. So in 1880, a British author, Vincent Holt, wrote a book called Why Not Eat Insects? And in it he wrote, I am fully conscious of the difficulty of battling against a long-existing and deep-rooted public prejudice. I only ask of my reader a fair hearing and impartial consideration of my arguments and an unbiased judgment. If these be granted, I feel sure that many will be persuaded to make practical proof of the expediency of using insects as food. Back in the 1880s. Okay. He said that, come on, there's all this food around and we're not making use of it. And back in the 1800s, he was seeing real poverty, right? We're eating bread and lard as the poorest of the poor. And he's saying, what about insects? But unfortunately, his pleas went unheard. And here we are 136 years later, still considering eating insects as a gimmick or a dare. But let's think about it in a different way. So, recently, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, the publishers of your big book here, um, released this paper on the possibilities of using insects as food to help substitute protein for a growing population and fight hunger. And this got many people thinking again, and maybe even before this was published, but this seems to be, for me, at least in my you know, st study of entomophagy, this was kind of the impetus for me, and maybe for other companies as well. So we were talking about, in this book, and this conversation began, we have a growing population, and we need to feed it nationally, globally. It's estimated that by 2050, 9 billion people will be populating the world globally, and our current food production is estimated to have to double to feed that number. So how do we double our food production? How do we do it? <clears throat> So let's take a look at our current production. We only have the land we have, and there could be limits. So for example, currently, already one-fifth of US land is in the production of crops. We already see that one-quarter of US land that's privately owned is used for grazing livestock, so our beef. And we see that worldwide, Land cleared for agriculture to feed humans is about the size of South America, if you compile it all worldwide. It's about 19.4 million square miles. That's 38.6% of all the land mass. So how do you double production to be 80% of our land mass in agriculture? It wouldn't be practical or possible. So we'd have to figure out some ways to double our food production without maybe expanding much of that land that we're already using for agriculture. And livestock production accounts for about 30% of our total land usage. And 70% of all agricultural land currently is for livestock, either for the grazing of it or for growing the feed that is fed to livestock. And we're also losing farm land, so farmland. So it's, it's estimated that 3,000 acres of farmland is lost to development each day in the US, for example. There is concerns about fewer farmers farming, and this is debatable. Um, so there are, are studies out there that say we have an aging population of farmers, but we also have some new and invigorated interest in farming from younger generations. And so we're seeing a lot of new and young farmers coming into the industry, and so it might not be as big of a challenge as previously thought. But we do know that today, one farm does support 140, 40, 144 people on average. And so we're seeing that we need farms to supply food for people, and we're already supporting a huge number of people per farm to feed the world. We also have a challenge in water. So less water availability is going to constrain our agricultural output. We all saw the news about droughts in California last year. Where do we get a lot of our produce from? the West. And so we saw a lot of uh, problems with the water shortages there and droughts. We also have concerns about environmental impacts caused by our current agricultural production. 
Um, so some of the things cited by the FAO report was that livestock emit about 14.5% of all human-linked greenhouse gas emissions. It's approximately 7.1 gigatons of CO2. And about 65% of that can be attributed to cattle, 9% to pigs, and 8% to chicken, meat, and eggs. But I'll also put in a little note here that termites produce a lot of greenhouse gases as well. So insects are not, you know, always the most innocent either. But we definitely see some concerns being voiced about these kinds of impacts as well in our environment. But it's not all doom and gloom. I'm not here to tell you that agriculture is at the end. By far, that is not true. We have worked to meet these challenges for a long time. Agriculture is one of the oldest sciences. We have been developing and advancing all the time. So here are some examples of some of the ways we're looking to meet challenges cited um, as our food future um, looks to be a lot more people to feed. So vertical farming, uh, you can use less space. It's done indoors, it's urban friendly. These are photos from a farm in Medina County called Buckeye Fresh and they have a warehouse where they grow um, greens and herbs indoors under lighting, straight up. Bugs don't get in, we don't need to use pesticides and they're doing it with aquaculture. So they're using water under trays that float and they're growing their food indoors. This is one way that we're meeting these challenges of feeding more people with less space. Genetically modified crops could be one way to think about meeting challenges for agriculture. Now, before I come and yell at me, love them or hate them, I have no opinion on this. But if you love them, you hate them, the technology is there. And it could be a technology that could be used to help increase yield and use less chemicals in the face of growing needs for food. So it is an option, but it is getting a lot of grief lately. And so will this be off the table by 2050? Who knows? Only time will tell. But it is something that's there that could help with feeding and nutrition. So for example, the bottom picture, who many, how many of you have heard of golden rice? A few of you. So golden rice is a genetically modified rice that is made to produce beta carotene to help uh, battle vitamin A deficiency. And so that would help in countries where they eat rice primarily in their diet, but here this one is made to produce more vitamins to help people be more healthy in those areas where rice is a stable food, for example. And we're also gardening in new places and farming in new places. So here's a rooftop garden. We're using urban reclaimed spaces to grow food. So there's a lot of new developing technologies and options out there to meet this food need. And myriads of other creative ideas. This is what aquaculture uh, farms, so we've got fa uh, fish growing or raising in here, and then the water is used to fertilize the plants. This is an uh, asphalt garden, so they've put a garden over an old abandoned parking lot. So lots of different ways to grow food out there. And insects as food is just one of those ideas to help expand our food repertoire, to expand the possible food sources to feed a growing population. And that's what we're going to explore today. So why insects? Well, they've ensured the survival of our earliest ancestors, and it's a known survival tactic today. How many of you have watched a television show where people are sent out into the woods, either naked and afraid or celebrities with bear grills. There's a lot of things out there where they're like, oh, here's a spider, here's a bug, and grab it off a tree and eat it. But it is taught as a survival tactic. If you uh, have a military audience, a lot of them do say that they've had to do this in training. Uh, some times when I work with kids, if they're in Boy Scouts, they'll say, hey, we learned about that in Boy Scouts. And so it's known today as a practical and healthy way to stay alive. Uh, indigenous people around the world continue to eat insects today. And a lot of non-Western cultures around the world still eat insects as a normal part of their diet, and we'll hear more about that later. They're also nutritious. They are a protein source. And arguably, they're considered pound for pound with beef or better in the amount of protein there, and it would depend on the insect you're eating. They're cited as being high in calcium, zinc, and B12. They have less fat and fewer calories. And we will explore some of that nutrition today uh, later as well. But we still have a lot to learn, still a lot of room for research. Why else should we look to insects? 
less space needed, you're not really using land like you would for larger livestock, and it can be urban friendly. Offer protein where access to conventional protein may be limited. So it might be harder to get a Big Mac in the middle of certain countries, um, more rural areas, than it is in America. Arguably, you need less water and less feed to support them. Um, and exploring the use of some of the unused portions of our food system to maybe rear them on, and that's something uh, research is exploring. They have a quick life cycle. They reproduce quickly and in high volumes, and so it could be easy to get a lot of protein quickly. The whole insect is eaten in most cases, uh, and so there's less waste or no waste. There's no bones, and unlike your crabs and your lobsters, you're not shelling them. And they're tasty, and you'll find out today. <laughs> so why should the US look to insects? Well, here is a cricket rearing habitat from one of our speakers today. Um, they are rearing them in a very small space, indoors. And so inside this smaller space, we can grow hundreds, thousands of crickets. Um, and it can be done inside, in warehouses. Um, this picture is obviously from Big Cricket Farms. And Kevin's here today. And his uh, farm was in downtown Youngstown. And crickets can lay about 1,200 to 1,500 eggs in a four-week period. So that's a lot of production. Um, insects arguably use less water, um, depending on how you figure that out. So some quotes have included that it takes one to two gallons of water per pound of insect meat. Um, but there are some studies and naysayers who will argue that it depends on what you feed the crickets. So if I'm using water to grow oats and I'm feeding oats to the crickets, we might want to add that water into that uh, consideration when we're calculating how much water is actually going into the production of insects. But generally, they're not drinking as much as a cow, for example. And arguably, they would use less feed than a larger livestock animal. So some quotes have included, it takes 10 kilograms of feed to give you one kilogram of beef. But 10 kilograms of feed would give you nine kilograms of locust or grasshopper. So that's an example of how we can use feed more efficiently to grow a different kind of protein. And again, the kind of feed is going to impact how well they reproduce and grow. So there was a very recent study done um, in 2015 that looked at, well, what can we feed crickets to get them to grow? And can we grow them on things like straw? Or can we grow them on things like buffet waste when you throw out all the buffet trays that aren't eaten in an hour? Um, and so they looked at different things to feed them. And they showed that you know sometimes it matters. They can't eat rocks, you know. And so that's something we have to look at to optimize the feed and also not be using the same kinds of feed that we're already using for other livestock, perhaps, so that we're not in competition. Uh, and we also see that insects produce less ammonia, less greenhouse gases, less manure. So those things uh, impact environmental considerations as well. So um, here's another example of the conversions of feed that have been cited. So for example, one kilogram of animal meat, generally, would need six kilograms of plant-based food. For chickens, however, you could probably get a kilogram of chicken off of two and a half kilograms of feed. Pork, a kilogram of pork, you could probably get it from five kilograms of feed. Beef would need 10. And insects, they're saying probably one to two kilograms of feed would give you a kilogram of insects. But here's an important point that's argued about eating insects. We would want them to be more efficient than chicken. And here we're seeing that they're fairly similar. And so some of the arguments you know, on the other side would say, well, if they're as efficient as chickens, why don't I just eat chicken? And so there's kind of the argument that you'd have to think about and make your own decision. Because, OK, well, what kind of feed am I giving the insects? Can I feed them something different? How much waste are the chickens making? Um, some people might look at the uh, welfare, animal welfare of the chickens as opposed to crickets. And that's another argument we're not going to have today. But those are some of the things to think about is generally they're pretty efficient compared to other animals. But the chicken, we'd still have to think about that one. But there's also an emerging market for crickets. They're considered gluten-free depending on what you feed them. So if you're raising them on oats and grains, they might have some gluten in them. They're considered paleo-friendly for people who follow that diet. They're protein-rich. And technically, locusts are kosher. And so 
for people who have these restrictions, either diets that they choose or because they have allergies to gluten, this might work for them. Also, there's a growing demand. So this is a graph from a far, uh, Tiny Farms. They produce um, cricket rearing technology, um, and they're showing that the US companies marketing insect products, and we'll try some of those products today, they have it cited as about 27 companies that are making cookies and chips and crackers, um, but there's only about four, at least as of last year, U.S. farms that are actually growing crickets that can be made into these products. So the demand is high. Let's start raising more crickets and mealworms and things that they can use in those products. We've even proposed insects for space agriculture, which I think is just fascinating. And in it they say insects could be useful both from an ecosystem design point of view as well as serving as a protein-rich food for human occupants if we were to travel long distances in space. So that's another reason to explore insects as food. So how many of you have eaten an insect before? <laughs> Some of you raised your hand. Well, you all have. And this is the best part about the KID program. So the FDA in Title 21, CFR Code 110, they have established limits for the maximum levels of natural and unavoidable defects in food for humans that present no hazard. And that includes insect parts. So when I talk to kids, I always have their favorite foods up here. And I say, well, how many of you like macaroni and cheese, which is a pasta? And it can have 225 insect fragments per 225 grams. That's crazy. And I always do peanut butter. So in this whole jar of peanut butter, there could be 135 parts of insects. And then we always say, and that's insect butts, and that's insect eyes, and they go, ew. So this is a great way to work with your kids. And I always have the actual items and pass them around or show them. And then, of course, the chocolate bar. It can have 60 or more insect fragments for 100 grams. And then we ask them, you're not going to stop eating pasta and chocolate, right? Who's, who's going to stop eating chocolate out there, guys? Of course not. And so we see that it's there. It's not affecting taste. It's not affecting quality. Um, and that's why there are these limits. They're unavoidable. Insects are where we grow food. When we harvest food, sometimes there's insects there. It's just going to happen. And this is just to point out that insects don't hurt you when they're in the food you're already eating. And then we ask, do you eat shrimp, lobster, crabs, and crayfish? Raise your hands. Who's eating seafood? So these are all insect relatives. They're considered delicacies. They're expensive. They're delicious. And as I mentioned before, they're all arthropods with those jointed exoskeletons. They're cousins. So let's consider adding insects to the list. And don't forget that you eat honey, which is insect-derived. Bees are making you honey. The mescal worm in your tequila. The cochineal drop red dye that's in a lot of food um, is a red dye that's derived from a scale insect. And so a lot of things you might not have even known uh, are related to or derived from insects that you're already eating. How many of you have had caviar, sushi, escargot, sushi? Sushi was once really taboo. And now it's pretty common, and everyone's like, oh, yeah, I'm going out for sushi for lunch. Uh, it was once a foreign and taboo food. Now you've at least heard of them if you haven't eaten them yourself. And they've become much more popular. There's tons and tons of sushi restaurants out there. Maybe there'll be a million bug restaurants one day. Who knows? Why should we give bugs a chance? They're arguably tasty. Descriptors have included spicy, crunchy, sweet, popcorny, nutty. Um, we've heard from chefs that say that if you feed them certain foods briefly before you harvest them, they can take on the flavor of like an apple. And so if you're a chef and you're trying to be creative, you say, okay, I want this to have a, like the hint of an apple in it. I'm going to feed my crickets apples before I fry them up. There's an option. And you get to decide for yourself today with some of the insect fortified products we've got. And also, they're new. It's exciting. It's adventurous. Um, adventurous foodies might be intrigued. Give it a chance. I'll try anything once, right? So today's your once, and maybe you'll eat them again. 
So in North America, we have many voices that have started joining this food conversation here in the Western world. So we've had chefs that have explored it, professors and extension educators here, young enthusiasts who are starting up startup companies, um, new graduate students and entomologists who are looking into it. Um, environmentalists are looking at it from that perspective as a good option for, for food. And then a lot of startup companies. So there's two schools um, for insect foods, and maybe even three. So we have the pure product. You can buy crickets or larvae, or you can buy the actual whole insect, and you can cook them yourself. So when I work with kids, we buy crickets and larvets, and I'll pass these around, and chocolate-covered bugs. And so it's the whole insect. and. Um, they get to try them and they're seasoned with like sour cream and onion flavor or cheddar cheese and bacon flavor. So they get like that chip flavoring, but it's the whole insect and you can buy those and pass them around and try them. Or you can buy unflavored whole insects if you want to be adventurous and make a recipe. Um, and I have a cookbook up here you can take a look at. The Eat a Bug Cookbook, which is by a very well-known entomophagy chef, um, David George Gordon. He's kind of the grandfather of the movement in North America. And so if you wanted to be adventurous and actually um, do that, there's a list on your USB drive that has some of the books. I also have a book called Cooking with Cicadas. And so for those of you on the eastern half of Ohio, 17-year cicada emergence this year. So we can eat cicadas. And so that's your pure product. But the one that's getting a lot of interest and is maybe more appropriate for the USA is this powdered product, which is either a flour that's made to be bakeable or the pure cricket powder ingredient as a protein fortified ingredient. So we can make protein shakes for people who are like bodybuilders or health conscious. And then also we have our cookies and things we'll try today that are ground up so you don't get that visual visceral reaction, but you still get the benefits of the nutrition and the health and the protein. And again, gluten-free for our people who can't have wheat flour. And then that third school, which you'll learn about later today, is using insects to feed other livestock. And so can we use insects for feeding fish or chicken and things to help give them the nutrition and maybe lessen the stress on the land when we're feeding them corn and wheat products? We also see chefs doing things at their own restaurants. Um, just a Google search of restaurants in the area reported that there's nine states with bugs on the menu and 13 restaurants listed. So for example, um, usually they're uh, South American, uh, Mexican restaurants um, or Thai food. So here you see Singapore style scorpions, Taiwanese crickets. Um, tacos de chapulines, which is grasshopper tacos. And so some of those things are out there already in popular restaurants. Uh, but again, that current interest for the shy at heart are cricket flower products. And just generally, and Kevin might be able to speak more to this, the process would be that they would uh, put them in cold storage so that the cricket's metabolism would go down and they'd kind of go into a hibernation. And then if you freeze them, they are killed that way. Um, then they're ground up, pasteurized, dried into a powder, but each company is going to have proprietary ways that they might do that or blends of protein powders or flowers that they make. So finally, I'll talk about some of the challenges we're facing. Um, so somewhere along the way, insects were stereotyped as the pest because they ate our crops. So that's what Jim was referring to earlier. We went away from eating them to controlling them. And our domestic animals served multiple purposes. So we had animals that were pulling hoes and plows. And then that animal could also be a, a food source as you know, beef. Um, we could then use the skin as a leather for clothing and protection. So we had purposeful use for those leftovers in early society when we were switching over from maybe that hunter-gatherer to a agricultural society. Uh, but we've had a lot of agricultural innovations in the last century, so you know why eat bugs anymore? Um, they're now considered unconventional and taboo, um, and we've left out insect agriculture in our agricultural innovations. So we haven't really looked at how do you farm a cricket well or what do crickets need to eat. Um, and so that's something we need to catch up on. So very little has been done to advance the field until recently with the advent of these new companies who are coming in giving it a shot. 
Uh, so some of the research needed um, is optimizing rearing, feeding, and breeding, um, processing to the highest nutritional output. You know, what can we feed them to make sure that they're giving us the best that we can get? Um, how can we make it better? What other bugs can we explore eating? Um, and what are practical? What markets exist for them? Regulations are vague. Um, what are the regulations for collecting them versus rearing them? Um, different countries have variable rules. So what we can do in the US, you might not be able to ship it or export it or import it. Um, you might need a license in some countries to harvest. Um, so certain uh, countries that are eating insects, they might have different regulations for how many can be harvested. And we're concerned about over-harvesting. We need to preserve the diversity of insects that are out there and doing jobs in the environment on their own. So we wouldn't want to over-harvest any. And so we're getting into, you know, that rearing is going to be more important to do it so that we're not impacting the environment. Um, you can get a generally regarded as safe label for the production and selling of crickets and other insect foods. Um, different best practices for the facilities need to be kind of laid out. Um, we can't wild catch them in the US as, as far as I'm aware. And again, that gets back to protecting those wild populations. So there's a lot of kinks in the regulation world that uh, still just haven't caught up with the interest. As far as I know, we may hear differently later. Um, also some unknowns, allergy concerns. So again, I mentioned that crabs, uh, lobsters, those are all relatives of insects. And so we're concerned that if you have a shellfish allergy, will you also have a cricket allergy or uh, other insect allergies? So when we work with kids, we always say if the, a kid has a known seafood allergy, we do not let them try the bugs. If they want to take some home to mom and mom can make the decision, fine. But we do not let them try it because we don't want to have anaphylactic shock at our 4-H events. Okay? Um, and also considering if you have a severe sting allergies, is there something to be concerned about? We just don't know all that much yet in regards to the allergies there. So we still have a lot to learn. So again, I give my caution to you, do not go out and catch your own insects to eat. And we tell this to the kids as well when we teach them, is there's unknown contaminants in the environment. If they cricket hopped over from your neighbor's house and your neighbor just sprayed the yard for bugs, there could be pesticides on those crickets or other insects that they might try to grab and eat. So that's why we say never catch them out in your backyard. There could be lead concerns. Um, and we don't know if we're going to be eating an endangered species. So again, we don't want to eat those wild harvested insects. And so we can buy them at the store. I passed around boxes where you can buy them. There's websites, um, products you'll see today. So you can all buy them online if you want to explore them and cook them. Um, and then we also want to cook insects. A lot of the TV shows show you eating them raw, but there are parasites and bacteria concerns just like any raw meat. So you do want to make sure you, kick, you cook them properly. So some of the progress we've seen. The University of Nebraska has a food allergen research program, and they've been part of a lot of these food conversations to look at that allergy concern. There's a company called All Things Bugs, which makes cricket flour, and they have received a USDA grant to improve rearing techniques and look at some of those other insect agriculture challenges. We have awareness building, like we're doing today, and working on marketing. So a lot of people suggest, well, why don't we call grasshoppers land shrimp? Because uh, that just has a better connotation in your head than you're eating a bug. So lots of ways we can make progress in this realm. So again, you'll have this in your USB drive, but there's lots of resources at the end of my talk for different ways to read more, different books, different websites, and some places you can buy some of these products that I've talked about. Any questions? Thank you. Yeah, so the question was, why don't we eat the shells of shrimps or the shells of uh, lobsters, crabs? Uh, I imagine it's a texture thing. They're probably sharp going down. It's probably not as digestible. They're much thicker than an insect exoskeleton is. Um, so that's probably why. But I know that they've used the, they can use the shells or the exoskeletons of those arthropods to like make broths and things, but it wouldn't be as digestible. <laughs> no, that's a good, so the most, 
common thing we're seeing insects made into are protein bars. So like your hikers and bikers who need that instant hit of protein and nutrients. So a lot of the insect products are this protein bar. There's also like protein shakes or like bodybuilder shakes um, that are out there. And then um, there's the cookies and the chips, crackers. Um, there's chips, cookies, crackers, granola, and I think that's it. That's a, like other food products. And then that would be people who are glute, gluten resistant. 